Okay, I don't see any hands raised, so let's move along on our agenda. We have uh, two working group reports today for you. Uh, one of the requirements for any working group council is that they must give a, at least one annual report to the full council membership. We have two reports today. Uh, the first one is going to be from the genomic wor the working group for uh, genomics and society. And Steve Joffe is the chair of that working group. He is also uh, the chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy and the chief of the Division of Medical Ethics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. And he's going to give the uh, working group report to you today. So Steve, are you on? I am. Uh, thanks, Rudy. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you quite Great. well. So thanks for the opportunity to present on behalf of the um, Genomics and uh, Society Working Group. Uh, as I think probably most of you are familiar with, the uh, Working Group has a number of uh, missions, uh, which are, um, if I can actually successfully advance my slides, uh, to uh, provide advice to council and to the Institute uh, on uh, short and long-term planning uh, and, and priority setting for the genomics and society activities at NHGRI, especially the extramural uh, LC research program. And in particular, to provide in, uh, input on uh, research priorities for the LC program on the balance between investigator initiated and program initiated research, and given the limited uh, budgetary and staff resources to provide some guidance on the best use of those resources. We are a, uh, at uh, full strength, a 10 member uh, council. Here are the members of the council. Uh, I will note that uh, Alondra Nelson in the bottom row, second from the, last, uh, from the left, uh, had to step off the council back in January to become deputy director of the White House Office of Science and Technology uh, Policy. I think it won't surprise anybody uh, today that the major themes of the last year or so of the council's work, of the, uh, of the working group's work, uh, related, of course, to uh, COVID and the pandemic and its impact on the genomics and the LC research community, on the intersection of genomics, health disparities, racism, and race. And, and of course, those two things are related and uh, the, on the strategic, strategic vision that, uh, has, that the Institute has been working on for several years and that the working group has had the opportunity to have some input onto. And I'll say more about uh, each of those topics uh, in turn. In terms of uh, COVID, uh, uh, it, again, it won't surprise you that the COVID pandemic has had a substantial impact on the LC research community, just like every other research community, uh, including uh, delays in studies that people uh, have been conducting, uh, including uh, both uh, senior faculty and trainees. A number of meetings were canceled, uh, leading to reduced networking opportunities, especially for junior people. For example, the LC Congress, which is held uh, every other year, was scheduled for June of 2020, uh, but had to be moved to a virtual meeting and was substantially scaled down with much less uh, opportunity for interaction that would have been uh, possible had there been more time for planning or had it been in person. This is a prime opportunity for people in the research in the LC research community to get to know one each other, to get to know one another, and especially again for uh, junior folks. Um, a particular concern has been the impact on trainees uh, due to hiring freezes and delays in graduate school admissions. This, of course, is true for every other aspect of the institute's uh, uh, constituency as well. And in particular, and I, I want to note this in particular, uh, concern about the impact on trainees as well as faculty and staff who already experienced the greatest uh, disadvantage. Uh, and this connects to the racial reckoning that we've all uh, been thinking about for the past year and beyond. Uh, members of the LC community who were themselves most affected by COVID in terms of uh, them, themselves, their families, uh, their communities, were also most affected by that racial reckoning uh, in terms of both practical implications uh, and demands on people both at work and at home. And, and I think we have to be very cognizant of that. There's also, in addition to impact on the LC community itself, been a substantial impact on the LC research directions, including, uh, I think, new thinking in the community about where to go uh, with our LC research. Uh, there has been an emphasis, given the, the many disparities that we all knew about, but that COVID has really brought to the fore, uh, emphasize the need for the LC community to focus on health disparities 
and social determinants of health as we think about our work in uh, genomics and its ethical and legal and social implications. Uh, this includes, of course, but it's not limited to issues related to structural racism, and I'll be talking about that in a moment. Uh, and uh, this has all raised many questions, I, I think, about the role of genomics in explaining and addressing uh, health disparities and how to integrate uh, scholarship on other explanations for health disparities with the role that genomics may play. So some recommendations for the Institute and, and for Council specifically related to COVID. Uh, the, the NIH, uh, we believe on the working group has a responsibility to ensure that uh, diverse and disadvantaged voices are included in conversations about the impact of events like uh, COVID. Uh, too often, and here I'm speaking generally, the people who experience the greatest negative impact of events like COVID, uh, both during the pandemic and also outside the uh, pandemic, are excluded from the, the spaces or the conversations about how to respond from a policy point of view. And it's important to make sure that the voices of those who are themselves most affected and whose communities are most effective are part of those conversations and part of decisions about how to respond. Second broad topic that I wanna uh, touch on and that has been the focus of extensive conversations in the working group over the last year involves uh, Elsie's role in responding to issues of structural racism, first focusing on our field and our, our workforce our, ourselves. Uh, again, much of this I think would uh, relate to, or be relevant to other uh, aspects or other components of the LC work or of the genomics workforce as well. Uh, first, there, there is a, an important need to attract both junior and established scholars from underrepresented groups and to diversify the workforce uh, even more than it already is. Uh, and, and in a related way to increase the proportion of the LC research portfolio that is itself uh, related to or address structure, issues of structural racism. In terms of our uh, research uh, building on that theme, uh, it's, it's our view that the principle of justice, which of course is a, a core principle of uh, medical ethics and of uh, research ethics and of ethics more generally, has not been sufficiently central to LC scholarship in, in recent years. And, and we think that the events of the last year have really pointed that out and that uh, that requires some changes in where the LC research uh, community pays its attention. Uh, we also think that conceptualizations of race and ethnicity are ripe for a re-examination in biomedical research and especially in genomics research. What is the relationship between uh, population genomic differences, for example, and conceptions of race and ethnicity? We think that LC research related to race and racism has not drawn sufficiently on the full spectrum of relevant disciplines. For example, sociology, political science, and law, just as some disciplines that we think have a lot to say and a lot to contribute, and we could do more to reach out and incorporate and engage with uh, people who work in those disciplines. And, and finally, historical and, and really contemporary, the uh, historical and really the contemporary role of genomics in racist ideologies has not received sufficient attention. And uh, we need to circle back to that and pay more attention to that. So again, to conclude this section of my presentation with some recommendations to the Institute, uh, we think there's a role that the Institute can play in educating all Institute trainees about the linked histories of racism and eugenics. We think that the Institute can play a leading role in working with the NIH and other members of the scientific community to clarify the conceptual basis of the inclusion requirements that we all endorse for the research that we do uh, and the reasons for those inclusion requirements and, and to what extent they are based upon hypotheses or questions about biological difference or biological diversity versus other aspects of uh, diversity and other reasons for inclusion. And then of course, to expand the pipeline and the involvement of diverse scholars in LC research such as, for example, by increasing engagement with minority serving institutions and historically black colleges and universities and increasing outreach to diverse scholars from adjacent fields where we think there is a great deal of diverse talent that we can draw on. In addition, uh, we think it is important to uh, continue the conversation about refining how concepts of race and ethnicity are used in research and publication. Uh, for example, uh, many of you are likely familiar uh, with recent statements by Kyle Brothers and colleagues in genomics and medicine, by Nat Flanagan in uh, JAMA, and uh, by Consuelo uh, Wilkins and colleagues in JAMA Neurology, which we think are all very useful uh, co contributions to this conversation about how we should be using race and ethnicity as concepts in our biomedical research and publication. 
And then we, we think it is worth brainstorming about uh, ways that we can use the grant application and the grant review process to encourage our focus on health disparities and structural uh, racism. For example, uh, by adding a prompt inviting applicants to discuss how their proposed study addresses issues related to structural racism or health disparities, to think about including non-scorable review criteria about how proposals might address health disparities, and to develop training for reviewers on challenges that might uh, particularly affect applicants from underrepresented groups. Now, the third issue I want to touch on is the um, NHGRI 2020 strategic vision, where the Genomics and Society Working Group and really the entire LC community has been able to provide extensive input on LC aspects of the strategic uh, vision during its development. We were very pleased to see the way that LC considerations were integrated throughout the vision document, uh, as opposed to being uh, pulled out into just a separate box, but really they were integrated throughout the document and we were very happy to see that. We think there's more to be said uh, about uh, the LC issues that are um, uh, addressed in the strategic vision. And we plan a, a follow-up publication led by members of the uh, working group that is gonna touch on what we think are some of the highest profile or most important issues uh, for today and for the, the coming future. Things like data privacy, sovereignty and data governance, uh, genomic technologies and their applications, both in biomedicine and in society, issues of race and racism and diversity in genomics. And then, as I said earlier, uh, the, the notion of justice really as an organizing lens for LC work. Before I close, I just wanna mention a few other areas that we think merit uh, focus both within the LC community and within the Institute. Uh, of course, the impact of genomics on society, we are the Genomics and Society Working Group. And we think that there is a continued important role to uh, play or attention to be paid to genomics and its role in society beyond health and medicine. Uh, for example, social and behavioral genomics, direct to consumer genomics, forensic genomics, and genomics and insurance, such as disability life and long-term care insurance. And those are just some examples. Genomics really is, is kind of special in a way in that our technologies have ramifications far beyond the realm of biomedicine. And these implications really help to explain why LC scholarship and LC competence are so important to the genomics enterprise. And of course, the continued need for public and community engagement related to genomic research. Other areas that merit focus include genomics and disability, the rise of interventional genomic medicines, such as the use of uh, gene editing technologies to actually intervene on people's genomes, the evidence for and the appropriate use of polygenic risk scores across a range of domains, and global genomics, including issues of diversity, inclusion, and capacity building in the global space. Our annual meeting, uh, we typically have uh, about three uh, shorter meetings or, or half-day meetings a year, uh, teleconferences or video conferences, and then in uh, more normal times, we'd get together for a day and a half or so uh, in person, that meeting, which is going to be virtual, but is coming up next week, is, a, is an opportunity for feedback from you all to, for, for me to bring back to that group. Uh, we have presentations scheduled on uh, the ethical, legal, and social uh, impact or implications of polygenic risk scores, and we're going to learn from folks who are involved with the Emerge 4 experience about that. We're going to focus on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion with a presentation from Vince Bonham. There'll be an update on the Center for LC Resources and Analysis or LC Hub, uh, an effort uh, led by folks at Stanford and Columbia to really collate the LC resources and make those resources available in a very uh, organized way to the LC community. And an update on LC related artificial intelligence and machine learning activities at uh, NIH. And then we'll, as I mentioned, we'll be working on a paper that is a follow-up to the uh, strategic vision document and during a working session at that meeting, uh, we'll be paying attention to that. So just to summarize, uh, challenges at the intersection of, society, of science and society really rose to the fore during the past year for a whole number of reasons. Uh, we think the genomics community second has a lot more work to do in reckoning with the legacy of race and racism. And that will again, continue to be a focus of our work. And we think that the LC community is really well positioned to help identify and address these challenges as they touch on issues related to genomics. So with that, uh, I will uh, stop and invite any uh, questions or discussion. As I said, we're meeting next week. And so anything 
uh, that you bring to me, I'm more than happy to bring back to the group for further discussion next week. Okay, thank you, Steve. Does the council have questions for Steve? Eric. Steve, thank you very much for that presentation. That was actually very helpful. I think very informative. I want to pick up on the last bullet of your um, last slide, your summary slide, and pointing out how the last year is, is rather unique, thinking about the interface of science and society. And I wonder, has, has, you, has the working group at all discussed, or maybe I could, maybe you could think about this, especially at your upcoming meeting, um, why there isn't, isn't more of a, of a presence of, of LC research at other NIH institutes? Um, you know, this is something that I, I was surprised when I became director 11 years ago that how unique NHGRI I was, and I just continually expected there to be greater uptake across NIH than there has. I mean, there has been some, um, and there's plenty of examples, and our staff can certainly talk about things they get pulled into to help advise and, you know, help design. But, you know, is there a sign about the last year? Has, has, has there been any evidence of greater interest or growing interest? And if not, uh, is it now a time to try to sort of figure out why that's the case or whether maybe there's things we could be doing to stimulate things more? Again, I'm just trying to pick up on that last bullet, the first bullet on your last slide. Yeah, yeah uh, thanks for that uh, question, Eric. Interesting that you say that in that even before the pandemic hit and even before the events of last spring and last summer, we, we actually began to have that discussion about why is it that genomics is sort of special in terms of the focus that it is given on LC. We actually noted that Neuroscience may be the one other place that has, well, it hasn't invested in the same way I think that uh, the genomics community has. It's the one other place where there has been that kind of focus historically. I'll get to the more recent events in a moment. And some of that may be due to the fact that both genomics and neuroscience really raise issues of identity and, and personal history and, and community history in ways that, for example, talking about specific organs, as you know, for example, organ focus institutes uh, may not do. But uh, so, so that's part of the answer. And actually it's something that we want to write about and incorporate into what we, this uh, document that we are going to be working on. But I, I agree with you that the events of the last year have really raised the, the need for these kinds of conversations across institutes, across disciplines. Uh, one, we have not, at least I have not heard other institutes that have really sort of begun to reflect on this conversation in a way that I think you're promoting, but certainly uh, they should be. And um, it is something that we'd like to articulate. What is the rationale and, and how can we as a genomics community share what we have learned and, and uh, what our community has developed with others where that might be helpful? So I will certainly bring that up. We've begun the conversation, but there's much more to be said. Thanks. So Steve, I'm kind of curious, you raised the issue of the history of eugenics and the connection to genetics and genomics. And there's a long history there and it's been involved in many, many different countries and many different societies. Is it simply a matter of reminding people because we forget history or are there new areas that need to be explored through LC research in that domain? Rudy, I think it's a combination of both. Um, I, I would raise the question of whether people who are younger people who are coming up through the genomic science or genomic medicine programs who are beginning their work in genomics, whether this is part of their sort of basic understanding of the history of our field. And so some of it is the, the need for sort of constant reminders of, of where we came from. And in part, it actually gets to Eric's question. This is one of the reasons why uh, there is a focus on LC research and LC scholarship within the genomics community. But I also think that the, there, there is um, a room for us to say, are there new questions that need to be asked? Is, is there uh, more work to be done, more historical work, uh, more analytic work in terms of understanding the, the basis for, um, for example, conceptions of race, right? Where, where do those come from? Well, it's actually uh, Dorothy Roberts and others have taught me that those conceptions of race actually grow out of racism, imposing a kind of construct of race on our conceptions of population differences, including in a biological sense. So that's new conceptual scholarship, new work 
that uh, folks like Professor Roberts and others have done that I think we need to build on and incorporate into these historical lessons. Okay, Wendy, I see your hand up. Steve, really nice job. Um, I'm struck at, especially now, how much have come up from an education or from a training point of view, these issues of race and genetics and being able to separate these and being able to teach them to our learners, whether they be medical students, graduate students, and then up through the ranks and to be able to disseminate this relatively efficiently and quickly. And I'm just wondering, has your group, or maybe you'll do it when you meet, thought about how you might be, how the LC community might be able to make a contribution, but in a distributed way? You know, it doesn't have to be institution by institution or class by class. Is there something that really thoughtful people could do, and then we could scale in terms of distributing that those those lessons? Um, Wendy, great point. That That is on the docket for discussion when we meet next week. And in particular, I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we have scheduled to have uh, with Vance and uh, his office and, and excited to learn about his new role and thinking about ways that we can work with him and his office and also with the UNITE initiative to, to do this work and, and to make this kind of training available, not just available, but, to, but really sort of put it in front of people working in biomedicine and especially in uh, genomics so that this becomes part of our shared understanding on our part and our shared history. That's great, thanks. And Lisa Parker, I don't mean to call you out, but you are also a member of the working group. And if, is there anything you want? Steve gave a very comprehensive report, but is there anything you'd like to add? Thank you. Um, no, I think that Steve's um, presentation was, was, um, was indeed comprehensive. Uh, nicely detailed. I look forward to next week's meeting. Um, I think that the questions we've had about uh, development of, of uh, or attention to issues of race and how to teach uh, new learners about that is, is really interesting. And I wonder if there is an opportunity to develop some resources, uh, interdisciplinary resources that could be used in a variety of different uh, venues, but that could be really uh, useful to uh, a full range of educators. So that might be something we can pick up on and discuss next week. I also see uh, Steve's hand. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I think this is incredibly important. One of the things that um, in, in teaching uh, people about you know genomics and the law or genomics and society, uh, if you delve into uh, the history, you go back into the 20s and, you know, there's some fairly significant uh, papers and reports out of Cold Spring Harbor and other places that, you know, actually almost serve as, as uh, examples of how this gets going uh, in, in a scientific community. I think it's, it's also a situation where at a, the scalability question that was mentioned is, is really important because at every institution, uh, on occasion, you you go into you know how this building became named after someone who was involved in eugenics or so forth, and and oftentimes one example of, is to rename the building, but that doesn't really help in terms of educating how it got there. Um, and so I think you know this entire question of how do you actually scale it and educate individuals of, of how this happened and how it shouldn't happen again is incredibly important. I, I, can I uh, quick response? I think it's a really important uh, point that you're making in terms of uh, how we deal with the history. If uh, uh, folks may or may not know about what's going on at University College London now, where some of the early uh, sort of founding figures of biostatistics really their foundational biostatistical work, people like Carl Pearson and Ronald Fisher really related to their work in population genomics and they were committed eugenicists. And so there's a whole bunch of renaming going on at University College London where they're trying to reconcile with or, or reckon with their own history. But I think that that's true of lots of places around the United States as well. Still lessons to be learned. All right, Steve, thank you very much for the report. Thank you for spending time with us and good luck with the meeting next week. Thank you. Okay.